I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke this morning. Luke chapter 2. Last Sunday I preached a message entitled Thanksgiving Peace. Thanksgiving Peace. Peace from God, peace among ourselves, and how God, through Christ, the Prince of Peace, provides that. This morning I preached a message entitled Christmas Hope. Christmas Hope. Here we are in the season of Christmas. And this is a very happy time for many people, but it's also a sad time for some. There are those who have lost loved ones over the holidays. There are those who have had other disappointments during this time of the year, and they struggle greatly because it brings back a lot of sad memories in their lives. And I think we need to be reminded this morning of how this is a season, though, we can minister to one another as well as our community and reach out to them and let them know that no matter what they're facing at this juncture, that there's always hope in the Lord. There's always a better way forward. There's always a better day coming. That one eternal day awaits us all if we are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We have a hope. We have someone to live for, something to look forward to. We have a hope. And this world needs this hope that we have in Christ. There is so much hopelessness. I was talking with Caleb this morning. I said, Caleb, do you realize the brokenness of this world? People living their lives like we all are in a broken world, oftentimes looking for something to satisfy, looking for something to fulfill, something to just look forward to in life, to get excited about or provide some kind of uh, outlet or some kind of refuge even. And people are searching, but oftentimes they don't realize what they're searching ultimately for is for that void that's in their heart that is left there by being separated from God through sin. And as a result, they need to be taught the truth of the gospel and how they can be drawn back to God, how they can know God, how they can place their hope, set their hope in Him, Psalm 78 says. That's what this generation needs to know of. Isn't it amazing how hopeless it seems so many young people are and their values are just so distorted and it's because they have no moral foundation so many times. No true hope of a better day or a better way forward. And as a result, they just live for the moment and indulging themselves. We by nature are self-willed and selfish. Looking out for ourselves. Christ changes that in us. He changes our heart toward Him and toward others. That's what faith and repentance is all about. And so as we think about this, here we are in this season of Christmas. We read the Christmas story, the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2 and how all the world should be taxed. There were 27 provinces of the Roman Empire at this time and they were all called to their respective places so that they might be taxed. There was a census taken every 14 years. And we think about how God providentially put things in place for Christ to be born in Bethlehem right there as the prophecy was given some 700 years prior. Amazing, is it not? You can read of Christ being born of a virgin in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. You can also read of that in Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 9 and how he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy all the way through specifically as God had said. And yet as God providentially guided Mary and Joseph here, they came into Bethlehem. There was no room for them in the inn. That was a picture of their poverty and the situation that Christ would be born into. A lot of times people say, well, if I had a better lineage, if I had a better background, if I had a better birth, if I had wealthy parents, if I had a different set of circumstances, I might have been somebody and done something with my life. Christ teaches us 
that you can have the most meager, disadvantaged beginning, but that doesn't define your future nor your end. God wants us to know that it's not the circumstances of life that determine who we are. It's who we are within that will determine those ultimately in our lives. And it will be able to prevail with the help and the understanding of God. Come what may, the poverty, the rejection, the disappointment, the disadvantages of life. And yet... We read in verse 8 about the shepherds who were keeping watch over their flock by night. I've stood in those shepherd fields there in that area. Amazing sight. And the Bible says in verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I want you to underline the expression there, a Savior, a Savior. The Bible says, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, a Savior, Christmas hope. You know, the greatest hope that men need in this hour is the hope of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. The hope of forgiveness of sin. That's the greatest hope that we could give. Now, we want to serve and we will do that. We want to give away gifts and we will do that. We want to provide meals. We want to do that. We want to be a blessing to our community in a very practical way. And we will do all of that for the glory of God. But the greatest thing we could do for our community and beyond in this Christmas season and throughout the year is to give them the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that he died for us. And though he was buried, he rose again victorious on the third day. And he's alive forevermore. That's the greatest message of hope that this city could receive. We take for granted and think that everyone's heard it. Everyone at least has been in church to some degree in their lives here in this area of the south. And yet that's so not true. If you would go and walk through some of our malls... I'm telling you, you'd be amazed at all the different nationalities now that are represented just walking through the mall in Charlotte. That's amazing, is it not? People are coming from around the world to Charlotte and Monroe, the greater Charlotte area. People everywhere who've never heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our great privilege as well as our great responsibility to get the gospel of Christ out. I wrote this little Christmas booklet a while back entitled The Christmas Story. And it's like a gospel booklet that just tells the reason for the season. Who Christ is. Why he came. How you can know him by faith as Savior. You ought to get these and send them as Christmas gifts or cards to people. Maybe co-workers, neighbors. Just a little token of appreciation. Just a little Christmas gift to say Merry Christmas to you and your family. A little booklet here tells the Christmas story. We take for granted and we think that everyone knows it, but they do not. They may have heard it in bits and pieces, but there are many that have never heard what it means to trust Christ as one's personal Savior. The greatest thing we could do for our community today and throughout this season is to give them the hope of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Carry gospel tracts with you. Look for an opportunity to be a witness. Look for an opportunity to invite someone to the house of God. Every member, a servant, a witness for God. That's the way this church should be. Everyone praying for the unsaved. Everyone trying to reach out to them. Do you know that people are more open to the gospel now? than any other time of the year. I still say Merry Christmas. And I would encourage you to do the same. I had a young lady say Merry Christmas to me at the grocery store the other day. And I say, thank you very much. Merry Christmas to you. That's a common greeting has been in our nation for a long, long time. And there's nothing wrong with it. And if I was in another setting where there was something else recognized, then I would just recognize that that's their way. This is something that we, having been given the Christian gospel, 
have learned to value and appreciate this time of the year. That this celebrates the coming of our Savior. The birth of the Messiah. The Christ. The anointed one. The promised one sent from God. People need to hear this message of hope. And people need to be open to that. And I'll tell you there are many people who are. And the greatest thing we could do is to give them the hope of the gospel. But a savior there we see. But the Bible says in verse 10, Fear not for I bring you good tidings of great joy. You know the greatest message you could bring to people is the message of the gospel. There's a savior. Sin separated us from God. Sin is that which we deal with in our own hearts that results in guilt or emptiness or shame within. A lack of joy or peace in our hearts. But I've got a message for you. Good tidings. I've got a good word of hope. A good message to share with you. It's a good tidings of great joy. Hey, there's a way of forgiveness of sin. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to somehow try to let your good outweigh your bad and be better than someone else. Christ accepts you for who you are and where you are. He'll take you where you're at. And he's able to save even from the guttermost to the uttermost. And all of God's people said, what greater tidings could we share in this day? But notice this. The Bible says in verse number 14, As the angel of the heavenly host appeared praising God, they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Underline that, peace, goodwill, peace. Christmas hope. In Christ you find salvation. In Christ, the greatest gift of Christmas, you find true peace. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that is genuine, that is real, that has depth, that is lasting. It's a peace the world cannot give you and the world cannot take from you. It is a peace that God gives, that inward tranquility of soul that comes from believing on Christ, trusting Him, simply trusting, simply resting in Him, knowing that God is in heaven and He's in control and that my life is in His hands. There is no greater place for my life to be than in the hand of the God who made me and saved me by His grace. There's great peace in my heart. So if I have peace in my heart, I can have peace in my home if we have peace in our hearts we can have peace in our church if we have peace in our hearts we can have peace in our community the bible says one of the great reasons that god has saved us and commands us to pray for those in authority that they might be god fearing that they might rule in the fear of god that they might respect what is right and that they might punish what is wrong according to romans chapter 13 is that we might lead a, a peaceable life. Think about that. A peaceable life. You think of all the turmoil that's going on in our world. The lack of peace is without is because there's a lack of peace within. But the Bible says there in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that God wants all people to be saved. And he knows that the key to a peaceable life is faith in Jesus Christ. But it's also peace that comes through prayer, through goodwill toward one another. I like how God put this together. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Goodwill. Do you deal with people in goodwill and in good faith? Are you someone that is truthful and trustworthy? Are you honest with people? Notice with me. Hold your place here, but look with me over in Proverbs right quick. Proverbs chapter 25. We read in verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee thee to shame. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thy infamy turn not away. 
The Bible says, now be careful just getting up in arms and running to take someone to task or to defend yourself. Go not forth hastily to strive. Sometimes we have partial information. Sometimes we have insufficient or inaccurate information. The Bible calls it evil surmisings. And so we draw wrong conclusions. And then all of a sudden we want to rise up against our neighbor and we want to denounce them or resist them or some kind, some way kind of put them down for something that we perceive that they have erred in. And the Bible says, be careful about that because you know what? It may not be what it seems. Everything does not always appear as it really is. And sometimes the way it looks and we're convinced it must be, it is not. And so the Bible says we're to deal with each other in good will and in good faith and in good conscience. Because we've got to meet God. And if we're wrong with something, or we erred, or we jumped the gun, and we made the wrong conclusion, then in the end, that's to our discredit and not our neighbor's. You see? The Bible says be careful about this. Notice with me over, the Bible says in chapter 3 of Proverbs here. Proverbs chapter 3. Can you imagine how this would change our communities if we just get this down the path, how Christ is the good news of the gospel? Amazing, would it not be? And then he produces the fruit of peace and goodwill. Goodwill. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 29, Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Devise not, don't scheme, don't plot, don't plan. Don't look at them and think, you know, I don't know. I don't trust him or her or, you know, or, or they offended me here or, or I think they took it. You, you better be careful just all that evil surmising, looking at people that way. You see, if you have a suspicious type spirit, that's not going to serve you or anyone else well, much less the Lord. Now, it's one thing to be a skeptic, meaning that you need proof. I'm that by nature. I'm not got a gullible. I'm not just easily convinced. I'm not just naive and thinking, well, yeah, okay. I'm someone that I want the facts. I want to know. But I do want the facts before I make a decision. Because that decision I make is going to affect my life. And those whom my life affects, you see. And so I've got to have that right heart and that right spirit knowing that I'm dealing with others in good will. I want what is right by God and by them. I would never take advantage of them. I would never advantage myself by disadvantaging them because, see, I've got to meet God with that, and that's not right. That's wrong. That's sin. Amen? God will not honor that. I want God to honor my life. I want God to to be pleased with my life. And the Bible says... Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Can you imagine how many people are counting on you in your own family, in your own household, much less your neighborhood, to be doing what's right? Can you imagine that? Your family members, they're dwelling securely by thee. They're counting on you to be doing what's right. Your co-workers, they're counting on you to be doing what's right. They dwell securely by you. It's just understood. I have confidence in that individual that they have got a good heart toward me. They've got good will and good faith in dealing with me. And they would never want to knowingly hurt me and do wrong by me. Amazing, isn't it? Do you know what's amazing as you read in the book of Romans about this matter of how love, if we truly love people, love is fulfilling of the law. Because if you love people, you won't knowingly hurt them. You see, you won't steal from them. You won't lie to them. You won't take their life. You understand? You won't take from them what is theirs. You won't be covetous toward that. You see, if we have true love, true goodwill toward others, God will bless that. God will honor that in our lives. It's so easy for us if we're not careful to overlook that and to get caught up in the carnal side of who we are by nature. And to give in to that. And to strive with others. And to be working against them. Always thinking that, you know what, here's what I've learned. 
What people oftentimes know to be true about themselves, they automatically, because that's the way they see it, think that must be the way everyone else sees it. And if this is the way I see it, they must be seeing it the same way. If this is the way I would handle that, that must be the way they would handle that. And they project that on someone else. And they think, you know, well, this must be the deal. But oftentimes what it is, and they don't realize it, is an indictment upon their own heart, themselves, and not another. That's amazing. I've seen that. That's human nature. And we should never strive with people. You know, there are those that they think, hey, you know, I've got to look out for myself. I'm not going to let somebody get one up on me. I'm not going to let somebody pull the wool over my eyes. I believe we ought to be prudent. We ought to be discerning. But I don't believe we need to start there. We don't need to suspect someone that we just met or someone that we're trying to get to know. We don't need to live with that kind of spirit because if we're not careful, we'll end up not dealing with each other in goodwill and in good faith. Oh, I think this is so important. Our community needs to know that, hey, there's hope in Christ. People can get along. You believe that? People can get along. Even though we're sinners, even though we fail the Lord, and at times we fail each other, if we will humble ourselves, we can get along. We can make things right with God and each other, can we not? We can have some joy and some peace and some hope in our lives, and we can share that with our community and beyond. People need to see this Christmas hope lived out in our lives. We talk about Christ has come. And boy, we get real zealous about saying Merry Christmas, and and we should. We get real zealous about those who would try to in any way cast aspersions on this time of the year. But let me ask you, are you living out what this Christmas hope is all about? It's one thing to say, I believe in Christ and I love Christmas and I don't want anyone to take away from that because it's a tradition in our nation or it's a tradition in our family. You know what? I respect all of that. But I'll tell you the greatest thing we could do this Christmas is to live out who this Christ child is in us because he didn't stay a baby. He grew up and he became a sacrifice for your sin and mine. Thank God for that. But you know what? He teaches us how to live. And he said we're to walk humbly before God. We're to love mercy and we're to do justly. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The lowliness, the humility. Not quick to strive. Not quick to defend. Not quick to shoot down. Not quick to just go after or suspect and say, you know, I know this. Be careful. On earth, peace. Goodwill toward men. But I like what else we read here. Notice Luke chapter 2. As the shepherds came, and the Bible says, when they had seen this Christ child, this babe lying in a manger, in verse 16, that they made known abroad the saying in verse 17, which was told them concerning this child. There it is, good tidings. The angels gave good tidings. We need to give good tidings, right? We need to share this news, this message of hope. But notice, the Bible says, I think it's great here. And all they that heard it wondered at, all, at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Do you see that? Which were told them by the shepherds. The shepherds went and told. Go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ is born. They went and told it. That's what God wants us to do. Well, the Bible says Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The word ponder there means to combine, to turn over, to toss, to ponder it, to connect the dots, think, hmm, to register. And the shepherds returned, what does it say? Glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. I want you to underline that expression there, glorifying and praising God. You know, all of us are looking for something or someone to glory in. You know, the Bible says, let him that glory, glorieth glory in the Lord. We glory in things 
We glory in people. We glory in accomplishments. And you know what? At the end of the day, those things do not last nor satisfy. I can tell you at the time when we won the Little League Championship, when I was 11 years old, that was a glorious day. I have no idea where my little trophy is. It must be in Daddy's barn somewhere. I hadn't seen that thing in years. Isn't that the way things are in this world? If you glory in things of this life alone, it's just for a moment. And then the glory fades. But if you glory in God, the glory gets greater and greater as the years go by. Because he becomes more real as we understand who he is. Our faith grows deeper and deeper for the glory of God. I'm telling you, this is a hope that this world needs. They need someone to glory in. Something more than just winning a ball game or winning a tournament or winning some kind of academic accomplishment. As important and as commendable as all of that is. If that's all we have, we stop short of the true glory we could have. It says, glorifying and praising God. Who are you praising? What are you praising? The fact is, is that we're not praising enough. Those who do praise are the exception. Those who do not have become the rule. In a land of abundance where we have so much, we never have enough. We have the most forms of communication that we've ever had before, but we never hear from each other. Isn't that amazing? We are in a time of this world where I believe because we're consumer oriented. And that is what we're indulged with. Oftentimes, the praise to God is so shallow. Because see, if you go after things, here's what you'll find. There'll never be enough. You'll never have enough. You always want another dollar. You'll want a nicer vehicle. You'll want a nicer, and there's nothing wrong with nice things. But I'll tell you what, if that's all you've got to glory in, if that's all you've got to get excited about, I'm telling you, there's really an emptiness somewhere within. And the sooner you recognize it and admit it to yourself as well as to God, the better off you'll be. Because the hope that we have in this world is not in things that will rot or rust or fade away. And by the way, isn't it amazing? That new car smell. I stopped at Auto Bell recently. They said, you want us to spray this with anything? I said, well, what do you got? They said, we've got new car smell. We've got this. We've got that. I said, new car smell. I hadn't smelled that in a long time. I said, I like that. Hey, it's still something about that new car smell, right? I still like it. But after you live a little while, you realize... Hey, these things don't last, do they? They truly don't. And can you imagine, I told the children this, can you imagine the men my age, midlife, they've worked for a while, they've got some things, and, and it's like, let me show you what I got materially. And I thought, after a while, you, how long can you drive that car? How far are you going to drive it? And then you're going to be happy? No, it's going to wear off my point. How long are you going to enjoy something of this world? You enjoy it for a while, then it'll begin to fade. That's the nature of the things of this world. But I'll tell you what, I'd much rather be someone who's found glory in God and praising His name. You know what I found out about a happy Christian who's got true peace in their heart? They're not only grateful, but they enjoy praising God. And we have different personalities I know. Some are a little bit more open with that. Some are a little bit more reserved. Some will say amen. Some will shed a tear. Some will raise a hand. And some will just sit there and just be blessed as blessed could be on the inside. And nobody could see it but the term, turning somersaults within. That's okay. Because it's from the heart. This matter of praise that God is looking for. Praising Him and thanking Him. We've got a lot to be thankful for, do we not? 
What would happen if people would come into this church or they'd find us along the way singing a song or hearing us praising God, standing there at the gas pump, and they're like, wow, what are you happy about? What are you talking about right now? I'm going to tell you how good God's been to me. You never know the doors of opportunity. It would open up to you for you to tell it, this message of Christmas and this message of hope. Now, as I thought about it, I was talking to Susan The other day, and I was so encouraged, I want you to hear this, and we'll pray. There are other community service organizations, and we appreciate them all, and the good that they're doing for our residents and others. But as we partner with different ones and try to help them with certain needs they have, I thought this was interesting, and this would be a blessing to you. Home health equipment such as wheelchairs, shower chairs, and walkers have been given from the Harbor House to the Union County seniors in need, free of charge. Isn't that a great blessing? See, the Bible says, let us not love in word only, but in deed also. See, this is the hope we need to see. To be able to give people the gospel sometimes, you know, to get to the heart, you've got to go through their stomach, right? It's been said. You've got to help them practically. I thought, what a blessing. Baby gear. Bottles and blankets have been given to mothers in crisis. Household items and clothes to others in need. Recently, the Harbor House was able to participate in the relief effort for those affected by Hurricane Matthew out east of our state. And we helped give to them through Operation Reach Out. Clothes, shoes, sheets, household items, were donated by the Harbor House and distributed to families in need in Lumberton area where there was great flooding. Aren't you glad our church had a part in that need? Amen? Goodwill toward men. You see, helping people in their time of need and doing it in the name of our Savior. There's an administrator who is a current Harbor House customer and she serves in the Crisis Pregnancy Center. She stopped by for coffee one day out here at our cafe. And walking through the Harbor House doing some shopping, she noticed a Bible on the used bookshelf. She purchased it, took it back to her office, and later that day a pregnant mom came into their facility. The woman was visibly in despair, and the administrator used the Bible she purchased at the Harbor House to comfort the woman with specific verses about God's comfort and provision. The tearful woman expressed her gratitude to God because she was praying for a Bible and knew that God would help her. That came through this little bookstore to this woman, to this mother in need, through the Crisis Pregnancy Center. Don't you thank God that he's put other people like that in place and he's using us to help them in those different ways? I'm telling you, there's a work to be done. And you don't have to do everything, neither do I nor this church. But we can do something, right? And something we must. And God will put in your heart what he can do through you this Christmas to show this Christmas hope that people need by faith in Jesus Christ. And it may begin with some very tangible way to show them the love of Christ by meeting some practical need that they have. Jason and others went to the community shelter Monday this past week and uh, served a meal there and also was able to talk to people and to help them with God's Word. Don't you thank God for that? And I'm telling you, it's one thing to sit in the church auditorium and talk about how great God is, and we should do that. We should praise Him and glory in Him here. But I'll tell you what, this is just the starting point because we don't stop when we hit those back doors. That's just the beginning. We go out here and we declare His wonderful works to our neighbors, our co-workers, to the attendants at the convenience store or the grocery store or wherever we may be as we go about our daily business. We are a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ, for this great gospel message of hope. I'm glad someone shared it with me, aren't you? Now God may be putting something in your heart to do. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Let Him lead you. What can you do practically for your neighbors to show them 
your love and that of Christ. Your co-workers, how can you reach out to them and put a gospel track in their hand or talk to them personally about Jesus Christ? If there's ever been a time when the church must step up and is given a great, great open door of opportunity, it's right now during this season of Christmas. And Jesus is the reason for this season. Let's go tell it far and wide. But let's start right here at home. Amen. Let's bow for prayer.